Hi, my name is Elaine Evans, and I am an extension educator at the University of Minnesota. In this video, I am presenting on the pollinator plate, which is a piece of the University of Minnesota pollinator educator toolkit. So these toolkits are comprised of both physical pieces that um, some people will receive, as well as remote online pieces that are available to anyone. So these are aimed at people who are doing pollinator education with, um, with all kinds of different audiences in the public. And the intention with this presentation is to give you an overview of what we have in this slide presentation about the pollinator plates and to um, give you options so that you as a pollinator educator can use the PDFs we'll provide for this slideshow to present this to your audiences and cater it to your audiences. There are also physical components I mentioned and um, there will be another video that will go over how to use those physical pieces, though, um, th though this may be helpful with information about, um, about the pollinator plates as well. This project is coming out of the um, input from researchers at the Department of Entomology in the B Lab. We have more resources at our website, z.umn.edu backslash pollinator ambassador. You can find out more about the toolkits, what these are, um, how to be a part of, um, of this community of pollinator educators. This work has all been supported by the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. So as you present these materials, we appreciate if you acknowledge their contribution, their funding made this project possible. The pollinator plate Activity starts with just some information about pollinators. And so the idea behind this whole activity is to look at how our food choices are affected by pollinators. So um, we know that about 80% of flowering plants rely on animals for pollinators. And you may have heard the saying that one out of every three bites of food is um, relates back to the action of pollinators. And this activity digs into that a little bit and um, provides you some more information to understand what's going on. So there are lots of grains like rice, corn, and wheat that are wind pollinated. They're not depending on animals for pollination. But most seeds, nuts, and fruits, and some vegetables do depend on pollinators. Even within that, things can be complicated. So there's some plants that would produce no fruit at all without pollinators to move pollen between plants. Other pollinators can still produce fruit, even if pollinators aren't around, but the fruit will be smaller, are oddly shaped, slower to ripen. So there's, even when they're not completely dependent on pollinators, there can be lots of benefits to having pollinators around. Aside from just those plant-based parts of our diet, how are dairy and meat affected by pollinators? While we don't get milk or meat directly from bees, bees and other pollinators can be pollinating important animal forage plants. Things like alfalfa are bee pollinated and have a big impact on the dairy and meat production. While we're focusing on food for this activity, I do also want to acknowledge that pollinators do a lot more than help us have nutritious and delicious food on our plates. They're also crucial for pollinating wildflowers that are supporting lots of other creatures, um, these plants that help filter water and build soils. So um, this, this relationship between flowering plants and their pollinators is the basis of this, this food system that includes all kinds of different animals, not just us. 
getting into what pollination is in a little more detail. Um, I'm just going to move myself out of the way here looking at what's happening with pollen. So pollination is happening when pollen is moved from the anther, the place where, where pollen is being produced in the plant, onto the stigma, which is connected to the ovary and where the seed and fruit production happens. So pollen is gets moved from an anther to a stigma, that um, pollen then grows down and fertilizes an ovule, that ovule becomes a seed. So whether a plant needs pollen move just within their own flower or across a garden, they all need help moving the pollen. And um, some plants get that help from things like wind and water, and others rely on animals. Looking at what seed production is, I'm um, talking about seeds and how does that relate to, to what we eat. There's things like almonds and other nuts that are seeds. Uh, often we're focused on the part of the fruit that surrounds the seed. So um, after fertilization, when this pollen tube grows down and um, will pollinate the ovary, those ovaries will grow and produce fleshy parts of the plant, um, which we know of as the fruits. So fruits can, um, can be thought of this, this thing that's growing around the seeds. If you have a fruit like an apple, you can cut it open and you can really clearly see that ovary in the center with the seeds at the, at the core of an apple. And um, there's lots of different ways that fruits are set up. So if you want to ever do an activity where you're grabbing a bunch of different kinds of fruits and looking at where the seeds are and tracing that back to the flower, that can be pretty interesting to see how those are connected. So now we're gonna move into going through some of these, these plates, looking at a plate of food and the activity here is thinking if there were no pollinators, what would be left on this plate? For almonds, it's actually nothing. If we didn't have bees, we wouldn't have any almonds. To produce nuts, the almonds need insects to move that pollen around to an almond plant of a different variety. So this is a really dramatic example where it's really clear uh, without bees, we wouldn't have almonds to eat. What about apples? If there were no pollinators, what would we have left on our plate? So actually it's the same kind of thing with apples. With most apples, they need to be cross-pollinated with a different variety, and that pollen needs to be moved to trees of different varieties. So we really do need, um, need bees and other pollinators to help move that pollen around. And besides just moving pollen, there's a lot of pollen, pollination that needs to happen. So sometimes just partial pollination can happen and you end up with these oddly shaped fruits or ones that um, end up dropping from the tree before they fully ripen. Getting into more kind of processed food, stuff you might see on your plate every day. What about bread with jam and butter? So um, the wheat in that makes the bread is wind pollinated, but um, everything else is reliant to some degree on pollinators. So dairy is re reliant somewhat on the um, cows having access to things like clover and alfalfa that are bee pollinated. So we'd probably still have butter, but have less, but that Jam is dependent on fruits that require insect pollinators. What about coffee? Coffee flowers can actually pollinate themselves without help from insects, but their production is, is reduced if they don't have insect pollinators. And so um, it's reduced by about 25%. So we'd have a lot less coffee. Um, it, it could would probably be more expensive too, since production would be going down if we didn't have um, pollinators helping us. How about this glass of cranberry juice? 
a similar kind of thing, but kind of on the other end. So, so some cranberries can produce fruit without, um, without insects moving the pollen around. The pollen can just be moved within the same flower, but they um, will produce a lot more fruit. And, um, and so without pollinators, we'd have um, just a little bit of, of cranberry juice as um, cranberry production would go way down because those cranberries do need insects to move pollen around. Here is a dish of ice cream. So, you know, we're talking about the importance of alfalfa and clover, but cows can also eat a wide variety of grasses. But um, the, those other the things like alfalfa and clover, clover are um, an important part of the diet. So it's, it's thought that we'd lose about a quarter. So we'd still have about um, three quarters of the ice cream. And then um, you have to think about what the ice cream is flavored with too. So if it's a fruit flavor, there would likely be, um, be less pollination happening there. How about pizza? We're getting more complicated here, getting in some other layers. So this has a lot of different layers here. Without pollinators, we'd have crust and some cheese, but tomatoes are dependent on pollinators. If you're having peppers on your pizza, those are dependent on, on pollinators. Um, cheese is similar to the dairy we've been talking about where we get some, but not a lot. So both the tomatoes and peppers rely on this buzz pollination where, where bees need to be right up on the flower and shake it to get that pollen to release. So they really are highly dependent on pollinators to help them. If they don't have pollinators shaking those flowers to get the pollen to come out, um, the pollen doesn't get a chance to move around to help the plants produce seeds and fruit. Potatoes, so this is going back to, to a nice simple meal of just a potato on a plate. And we would actually have potatoes. So potatoes as a plant do pretend on, depend on pollinators for seed production, but most potatoes that we eat are grown by planting pieces of the root, the tubers, and those are the parts that we eat. So without pollinators, we could still grow potatoes um, as long as we have those, those tubers to start them from. Rice and beans are a staple to the diets of people um, all across the world. And um, if we had no pollinators, what would be left here? Rice is wind pollinated. Many beans are self pollinated. There's a few that will do better with, with bees pollinating them. But um, we'd still have rice and beans on our plate. <coughs> but um, what if we, if we want some other flavor there? What if we want to put some salsa on that plate? Looking at a salad, what would be left? And the salad has avocado and tomatoes. So lettuce is self-pollinated. We're eating the, the leaves that grow out and are not dependent on, um, on pollinators. So we can have the lettuce, but both tomatoes and avocados are, are dependent on pollinators. Um, so we talked a little bit about tomatoes already. Avocados, um, are, they, they have this unique system where they try to avoid self-pollination where the flowers only open for a cup for two days and on the first day the flower um, can receive pollen then it closes and opens up again and produces pollen so each individual flower is um, has this system set up so it it can't pollinate itself so they're really dependent on pollinators to move pollen between those different flowers Strawberries, there's a little sneak peek of this at the beginning, but if we had no pollinators, strawberries are one of these flowers that they can pollinate themselves, but um, without insects to move the pollen around, the entire flower usually doesn't get all of the pollination that it needs, so you'll end up with smaller, oddly shaped fruit. And um, strawberries are an interesting 
fruit to look at in terms of, of figuring out how that flower turns into the fruit. So each of those seeds on the strawberry fruit is a, a result of pollination. So there's a lot of pollination that needs to happen to produce all of those seeds, um, with a typical strawberry having 200 or 300 seeds per fruit. There's um, a lot of pollen that needs to move around. So I hope that this was interesting. You can um, add whatever details you want in here. And you're working with audiences of different ages, you can highlight different fruits that they would be interesting, the different different food impacts that would interest different groups. If you want to learn more about any of this, about the Pollinator Toolkits, you can visit us at www.blab.umn.edu. And again, just a thankful reminder that this work was supported by the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. So I hope that this is an interesting and informative tool to get people thinking about what they see on their plates, what they owe to pollinators, and understand um, the importance of supporting pollinators out there in the world.